In this video, I battle a sim racing YouTuber and militarily trained American assassin in an eSports world first. We interview a man that sketched a motion simulator to impress his wife. Multiple sim racing pedal myths are destroyed. And I do a simulated lap of the Nordschleife whilst giving a first impressions of some new sim racing pedals and an absolutely insane motion simulator. Fasten your seatbelts, it's going to be a wild ride. But before you get on the wild ride, click that like button, subscribe and have a cup of tea. As a continuation of my really hard and arduous life, I was recently in Portugal. That's because Imsim invited me and some other sim racing addicts to not only take a look at their new Talento sim racing pedals, but to also have a tour of the Imsim factory where they put together the pedals and some rather sexy monstrous motion simulators. Before I jumped on and played with the toys, we sat down with the guys behind Imsim to ask them how they got into the dark seedy world of racing simulators. So, uh, my name is Hugo Azevedo. I'm the CEO and the owner of the company behind the project Imsim. I used to say that what I like to do is to define where we want to go and then to help with the team define how to get there. So that's my main job uh, here at Imsim. Can you tell me a bit about the uh, company's history and how you got started and where all this madness began? Yeah, so uh, the company behind the project is a company called Sirmaf, which had 33 years, okay? It was uh, started by my father. Uh, the main product that we do are special machines. So our customers, they have process, industrial process. They don't find machines by catalog, standard machines to do what they want, so they call us and we will make the development of mechanical, electronics, IT, and then we will build like the, the, the machine to meet their requirement. So this is like the, the technological aspect that is behind the project. Uh, the project of uh, IMSIM hardware started uh, when I was looking for a simulator to myself. I looked everything on the market and I showed to my wife. Uh, I showed my wife, what do you think of this one? What do you think of this one? What do you think of this one? And her did phrase she, was... Did she say, no? Yes, <laughs> no, it was like that, no. What are you doing? It was <laughs> not just no, it was no, they are ugly. If you buy one, you will put it on the garage. It was like, okay, if I buy one, I will put it on the garage. Okay, no problem, I will put it on the garage, was my first, my first thought. Then I, I discussed that with my team member, I told this story inside. And there were a couple of guys that said, well, maybe we can do one. Why can't we do one that could fit the living room? And I was like, oh, yeah, you're crazy. But then the, the idea grew on me. Uh, we, had a, we, we have the, the person that made the design of the simulator and I, I gave him some, some topics and said, okay, how would look a simulator to fit the living room? Okay, uh, what would be like the important things? And please make a sketch. Okay, he made the sketch of the simulator uh, and I showed my wife the sketch and I said, okay, what do you think about this? And she said, if it looks as good as this or similar, I will allow you to put it on the living room. And I was like, okay, maybe we are into something. Uh, I talked with the team, a lot of, uh, of, uh, of my, my, my team members, they are sim racing enthusiasts and they like the idea, obviously it was like their dream come true, okay, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. I, t I took some time, I took like six months thinking about if it makes sense, and then I presented the idea to my father. And I think, okay, he, he's gonna say, you're crazy, no, no way, it makes no sense. But he said, okay, it makes perfect sense because this is a machine, so at the end of the day, those are the same technology we use on what we do, so maybe you want to, you, you into something. And so, uh, from that point, we, we make the development and uh, long story start, now I have a simulator in my living room. So, uh, at the end of the day, we met the look, the aesthetics of uh, what my wife said, okay, you can put it in the living room, and we achieved that. Uh, so, the main pillars that we, we, we went when we thought about this project, and we put on the simulator, and we want to put it in all other products we will do in the future, was those ones, was the, the fact that it's design is important, 
uh, not just talking about aesthetics, also about function. Uh, as you, you saw, we, we make like uh, in the simulator, uh, very important for us the cable management, for example. This is very passionate about cable management. Very, cable. very, very passionate about <laughs> it, which is once again, not only design, design as aesthetics, but also design as function. Uh, then it needs to be innovative. And in that respect, we, we knew what was on the market and we tried to define what would be our standard, where we would be different. Reliability, very, very important. As you know, we are using like industry standard solutions that sometimes are more expensive, but we know for a fact that they work. Uh, the, the experience that CIRMAF has is building machines for China, building machines for the US, and I don't want to build a machine here in Portugal and then send it to the US and have problems all the time. So reliability is very, very, very important. Not just for the customer to be happy, but also for us to not have to go to, to those countries and to, to spend a lot of time and money to, to do so. So very important at that price range that you have a product that is perfect. And then at the end of the day, the experience, the fun you get from the product. Okay, from the simulator, it was the same thing. How fun will it be to use? how good of experience it will be. We choose by, by it was an option. Uh, we choose to have like not a lot of motion, not like roller coaster, okay? We prefer to have like small and precise movement. And once again, it was like a choice we made uh, given that, that range of pillars of, uh, of, of the product. In terms of the new Imsim Talento pedals, why did you, because obviously your background is producing the Imsim motion simulators and platforms, what spurred on the uh, wanting to create your own pedals? We know, we understand that the simulator, it's not like a product for everyone. Okay, it's very expensive, uh, so we know it's not mainstream, it's not for everyone to buy. Uh, and we talked about the, the, inside the team uh, what would be like the, ne the next development in terms of products, and we discussed that it would be important for us because we don't want to be like just a simulator brand. We want to be a sim racing hardware brand. Uh, and we discussed what could be the next product. And we decided internally, we decided a lot of options. And pedals was the one that came up a lot of times. Okay. Uh, and so we, the idea behind the pedals was to do like a product that fit those four pillars I mentioned. Design, innovation, reliability, and experience. Okay. But in a more mainstream product that is completely different from the simulator. So at that time, we once again looked at the state of the art. We looked at the pedals we knew, okay? Uh, we use pedals, obviously, for our simulator. Our customer use different brands of pedals, so we know a lot of them. And so we start thinking about, first, the price range. So the price range was like, from the get-go, what we wanted to achieve. And then we made the development on top of that. So in terms of the price, we decided we wanted to be like the entry level uh, load cell price, pedal price, that was our goal, but with the top tier load cell uh, quality. Okay, so that's where we thought we could be also innovative. Okay, and uh, where we could make a difference. Uh, so that was like the baseline. And then, like I mentioned, development was like, we have to follow that goal, okay? This is obviously one that it's uh, challenging, but once again, we knew that in this kind of product, we either do something like that, or we are just like another brand. One more pedal. So if we want to enter uh, this market uh, by storm and really make a success, we, should that, we, we thought that sh that should be the, the way we, we, we would think about the product. So yeah, big thanks for having us here at this event and uh, getting to experience all the, the factory floor and seeing how it all works, but also crucially having us uh, experience some of the Portuguese culture. Absolutely fantastic, so really appreciate that. Uh, you're welcome. It was really cool for us to receive you and to, to have the opportunity to show you who we are, uh, what do we do, how do we do it, and I hope you enjoyed yourself. I'm looking forward to breaking some equipment. I think, <laughs> I think Good luck with that. <laughs> Following on from that interview, it was time for a bit of a competition between myself, Race Beyond Matter, and the Sim Pit. So Imsim have the new Talente pedals here, which uh, we've been informed are highly adjustable, but highly adjustable quickly. And uh, in order to sort of demonstrate that, 
they've set this a challenge where it's going to be me, obviously Game of Muscle, versus Race Beyond Matter and uh, the Simpit. And the challenge is going to be to adjust these pedals to a specific setting. Now, none of us know what the setting is yet. Uh, we're about to find out. Thiago's going to tell us. Yeah. And uh, then he's going to time us and we'll find out who is. The master of quick pedal settings. So, uh, what, what settings do we have to actually go for? Yeah, I had to debate myself whether to give you a tough challenge and have fun watching you suffer or making it very easy and make the pedals look good. So obviously I chose the first one. I want you to, to have as much of a challenge as possible. So you're going to have to make changes on all three pedals. I want you to go all the way up on the stiffness on the accelerator, on the throttle, leaving the preload as it is. I want it to go all the way up on the stiffness, actually all the way down on the stiffness on the uh, clutch with uh, the same preload setting and I want you to swap this elastomer with the white one over there and uh, as soon as you finish that okay. I'll stop the stopwatch. Okay, so I think, uh, I think, I think, uh, who, who's going to go first? You should, you should, should go 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 first. I'm not going first. Yeah, he's, he's just presented, yeah, come on, he's just presented. Simpit, I, I'm Simpit. Gonna, right, Simpit's going first. Yeah. Tight, <laughs> loose, tight, loose, swap. swap. We, we, okay. uh, if we ask again, it's going to be under the timing, so you can, you can ask for help. <laughs> right? we, we're, we're allowed to ask for help, but when we can do, it's going to be part of the timing. So yeah. as, soon, as soon as you touch, that's when the timing goes. That's 13.56. Uh, right, that, is, that, is, that is ridiculous. No, this is because of me as being in the military. He's like, this <laughs> guns are <laughs> fully, It's fully cleaned now. Get timed when taking apart uh, the rifles and stuff, so yeah. I'm gonna look terrible. Ready? Ready? You guys are way too fast. Ooh, wrong way. <laughs> That's Wait. Easy. We have not finished yet. Just a sec. is now the hardest way. That's true. Oh, it's got easy. It's got easy. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's maybe slow, <laughs> but all the way. So now we have 18.85. Now I can't compete with him, so I'm going to do this one. <laughs> wait, 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 one handy, one handy. Wait, 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 This is coffee, but let's pretend it's tea. <laughs> Very anyway, impressive maybe still. Maybe don't do it one hand. <laughs> Make sure you've got a race beyond matter with you to, <laughs> to pick up components. Are we putting the spring on it as well? Yes. Not paying attention to the score, as usual. Uh, by the way, are. This is a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Stop it. Where were you? Oh. You need to stop it. You need to stop it. Oh, Come on. Why did my equipment break? Oh, hang on, it's because I always forget to put it together. <laughs> okay. The other way around. There you go. I like how they just did it seamlessly. Well, you have a cup in your hand. Come on. And that's it. That was not tight yet. Yeah? Yeah. 
up again. You can do it. And everybody died of old age. And stop. <laughs> so that was 1 minute 41 seconds <laughs> and okay. 52 hundreds. As the adjudicator, obviously, they've been eliminated through <laughs> cheating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they didn't do it with a teacup. Uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, technically, you won that, really. Simpit. Well done, Simpit. Um, you walk past you and you win, you win pride and glory. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, I think, I'm, joking aside, that was an awesome demonstration of the fact that you can literally just change those settings straight away, uh, which is nice to see. Uh, great if you're jumping from car to car, but yep. thanks for that challenge, Thiago. Thank you. I'm now going to, I need more practice on doing this. <laughs> After being thoroughly destroyed by Race Beyond Matter and the Sim Pit, I'm telling you guys, Amir is literally an assassin, I accosted Jose to get a tighter, closer, more nerdy look at the Talento pedals. So with these Imsim pedals here, I thought we'd be interested to go over some of the details close up and ask Jose here why Imsim have made the decisions they have made with them. Uh, for example, they use potentiometers, uh, and for example, the nature of how the uh, durometers are set up and some other just close up details of, of the equipment. So the first thing, and I think this is a thing that surprised me and I think a lot of sim racers would sort of latch onto, is that both the accelerator and the clutch pedal um, use potentiometers. Now for those of you who don't know, uh, potentiometers measure the physical distance. There's a, a plate in there measuring the resistance, so you've got a physical distance there. Whereas some pedals will use Hall effect sensors, or some pedals will use a, a load cell which measures the pressure. Now, obviously, the brake does use a load cell, but can you explain why you've got uh, why you've gone for potentiometers on the accelerator and clutch? So there were basically three factors for us. So the first one was that we did not want to develop. Uh, the electronics and we are using Leo Bodnar electronics which are very good and have a 16-bit uh, um, uh, um, precision and so the, the electronics were uh, made to use one load cell and two potentiometers so that's what, one of the reasons the second reason was the packing so the packing of the pedals were, uh, for us was better to use a potentiometer so as you see it is very well packed on the side and we didn't have enough space to use other technology on the packaging that we want for the pedals. And the third factor was uh, uh, precision for our case. So we do have an axle that goes through the pedal and that is um, uh, fixed to this uh, motion sub-assembly. And if you can feel on this side, the potentiometer moves exactly the same rate as this assembly. So this was uh, for us very important to make sure that the movement is actually the, uh, registered correctly on the potentiometer. So we did not want secondary systems measuring another travel uh, than the real uh, mechanism that is causing the, the motion of the, um, of the pedal. Okay, yeah, so I, th I think one of the things that's worth stating is there are these sort of myths in sim racing where people go, oh, it needs to be a 100 kilogram load cell because that's better than a 10 kilogram load cell or it has to be a Hall effect or it has to be this. Ultimately, you can use potentiometers just as well as you can Hall effect or a load cell. It totally depends on the actual configuration and the specific potentiometer Hall effect or load cell that is used. Yeah, for example, this kind of potentiometer can be used on, for example, uh, cams controlling the cam position on, on an engine and stuff like that. So this is a very high quality, so automotive grade uh, potentiometers. So and we choose that because we want uh, high mechanical reliability and also a component that uh, is very good for the customer and has a long lifetime. Okay, so on from the uh, from the potentiometer myth potentially to the uh, the brake pedal myth, which is uh, the uh, there's this idea in sim racing that brake pedals uh, for high-end pedals have to be rock solid, like a, like a brick that you're pushing on. Um, the reality is if anyone's ever driven a real sports car or track car or go-kart or anything, drivers can set the brake pedal up however they want. Uh, some cars have very stiff brakes for various reasons, some have them very loose and some are just set up by the driver to their choice. So um, that's what you've tried to go for here is to uh, make it as 
choosable. Yes, <laughs> for exactly. The... So what we've made is on our standard kit, you are able to get two forces, so 100 kilograms and 60 kilograms. And uh, with uh, what we think is a, a good compromise between force and travel. And also you have as a standard the, the disc to brake pad uh, um, um, gap. Um, but if you purchase the, the performance kit, you can do anything you want. You can even have uh, like two millimeters travel up to if you choose all the rubbers, you can go to the what we call our standard travel that we feel it's a good compromise between uh, travel and feeling. Uh, but we have all the options, so I think it's the better solution because everyone has a different uh, way they want to feel the brake and for us that's, that's crucial. You know, of course, personally I will set them up incorrectly because I'm mental. <laughs> but um, how about for you? Uh, for me personally, I, would take, I always take out these sort of springs. I, d I don't like having that gap between pushing the pedal and it actuating or, you know, I just like it to be as direct as possible because I, I think that's more immediate and uh, more responsive. What's your, is that, is that I, your preference? I actually or? prefer the feeling. No, but, no. Uh, <laughs> but the good part is that you can do whatever you want. If you don't want the feeling, you can take it off. <laughs> if so. you don't want the feeling, <laughs> you can take it off. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, uh, I, I, I would be taking it off on mine, but. Well, for those people that want to know the Newton meter value, uh, how, what is the rating of the load cell? So the load cell is a 200 kilogram load cell. Um, this is not really important, it depends, the, the rate of the load cell depends on the mechanism that you build. In this case, as we wanted a compact, uh, a compact pedal, uh, we choose a 200 kilogram load cell. But for example, we could do the same job with a 20 or a, with a 100 kilograms, but the mechanical part we needed to change. So the leveraging and stuff like that need to change to accommodate a different uh, rate of a load cell. But uh, as long as you do the mechanical job correctly, you can choose whatever you want. Okay, and then finally, uh, for all the super nerdy people, uh, and obviously what's really important, uh, what resolution are the, so for the actual resolution for the uh, load cell or the... Uh... Yeah, so we use 16-bit uh, electronics, so basically the, the resolution for the transformation between analog signal and digital signal is 16-bit. So in practice you divide the 5 volt in uh, uh, 16 bit, which are more or less 65,000 steps. So that's the resolution of the, the measurement. Uh, so what you've just said to me there was that uh, if they're 16 bit, so yeah. if you used 16 bit, that's twice as fast. I mean, you're twice as fast as a sim racer than if you're using 8 bit. And uh, so really, 32 bit <laughs> would be even faster. So uh, when are IMSIM going to do uh, 512 bit? <laughs> Or, or 1.3 gigabit, yeah. Because then I, we'll be do, we'll be lapping the Nordschleife in half a second, yeah. Very quick. So yeah, that's interesting uh, thing. So I think from even 8 bit forward, it's more than enough. Um, so it actually depends on the travel that you have and stuff like that. But it's good to have a good resolution because if you want a lower travel, you can have uh, still have a good uh, resolution on the travel itself. But um, if we go much higher, it starts to, to lose the, the meaning. But um, it's up to, to each developer of each pedal to decide what they want to bring to their clients. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Jose, thank you. <laughs> for going through those uh, myths and some of the uh, unique aspects of the uh, IMSIM Talente. Did I say that correct? I, yeah, more did, or less. That was, that was no, you yeah. completely failed. The IMSIM Talento. Subsequent to that and being reminded that I have the eloquence of a beached dolphin, we finally jumped into the IMSIM motion simulator and gave the pedals and the motion sim a bit of a bash. Right, we're in the simulator and ready to start rolling around the glorious Nordschleife. So uh, before we jumped in, actually uh, we were tweaking the pedals a little bit and sent it up to uh, how, I, how I personally like it set up and uh, because I have weak, pathetic and ironically non-gamer muscle legs, uh, I've actually set the brake up quite sensitive and uh, with, uh, with quite a soft gyrometer on it. Um, and the crucial thing is I've set it up so that uh, the gyrometer has got, it's soft initially with the travel and then hits a hard point, but it hits the hard point at uh, about 75 
80% input, which means that, uh, for example, let me just hit the brake here. If I hit the brake, I, I'm sort of topping out at that point there, but I can obviously, I can push it even harder to go fully onto the brake, which is really nice actually. It's something I've been experimenting with and playing with these new pedals, is getting that feel to line up to a specific point on the pedal. So without me even developing uh, a muscle memory and feel, uh, you can set the pedal up and immediately get to a point where you uh, can dial it in so that you're not accidentally locking up or so you have a feel from the pedal, a feedback from the pedal to know how much you're pushing the brake pedal, um, which is actually quite interesting. So I find with most uh, of the, the pedals on the market, or most pedals that I've used, um, it's more a case of uh, you, you sort of set the pedal up in a, in a, in a set way and then you develop muscle memory, you sort of just learn that, that, one, that one feeling it has, uh, rather, than just, rather than being able to uh, adapt it and set it up um, and have it almost communicate to you immediately uh, a, a, a feel that you can respond to. So one of the problems with driving simulated race cars, and especially with braking, is that uh, you obviously don't have g-forces to actually tell you uh, how much you're braking or where the, the limit of braking is or uh, just a feel for how much brake force you're putting on a lot of the time whereas in, in a real car um, you can actually really clearly uh, feel through the g-forces exactly what's going on if you can brake harder or not uh, so in a sense you're kind of using the feel of the brake pedal in the simulator to uh, almost replicate although it's in a static way but you're replicating uh, that real world g-force field to an extent um, with a simulator like Assetto Corsa though you also do get a feel through the steering wheel for braking so uh, you do get a little bit of that motion feel which through the wheel rather than through your entire body but uh, as I say with these new uh, Talento pedals the adjustability is actually really uh, really awesome and the fact that you can just uh, we've, been, we've been going through all the settings on these pedals uh, swapping over gyrometers on them changing the uh, strength and weaknesses of the, uh, the, the accelerator and the clutch um, really quickly. So that initial phase of when you get pedals and you're first dialing them in is a lot less, uh, a lot less time consuming uh, with these pedals, which again, I think it's, a, it's actually a really quite a nice feature. So uh, in terms of the, the motion rig here, Normally, I would say, uh, my, my favourite type of motion rig is actually one where, um, more like a solution where you've got four point actuators, so you've got an actuator in the corner. Uh, this motion rig uses uh, two, oh, we're going a bit, 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 bit hot into that. This motion uh, simulator uses two actuators on the rear, um, and then that's on a pivot point on the centre. But I will say, despite that, it's still uh, it's quite surprising the actual uh, track texture details and you do bizarrely you do feel like there is a little bit of lift of the road surface though uh, for me i think it, it does miss that front lift a little bit so if i was being critical i'd like those front actuators but of simulators that have two rear actuators uh, this is actually quite nice in that regard but i prefer a bit more heave however one thing that this rig does do really well, um, and that has actually really surprised me, um, and this is one of the first rigs to, that I've used that's been set up in a way where this works well, is uh, this actually has a, uh, a, a traction loss system in it. So uh, as the rear pops out, the, the, the rig literally rotates uh, on, its, on, its, uh, on its central axis to uh, give you a degree of that feel of the back of the car popping out. Um, in the past, when I've used simulators that, that have that, um, it's tended to feel um, a little bit too over the top, a little bit delayed and very artificial. But uh, on this, the, uh, the traction loss is actually really, really quite nice and uh, not obnoxious, uh, even with faster cars. Uh, so I have had a chance to drive this with uh, the, f uh, the f F2004, which is such a good car in the Seto Corsa. Um, and of course, we're driving the Porsche RSR here, which is quite a quick car. And uh, when, you, when you just throw the car in a bit too hard, or you get on the brakes a bit too hard with the too much steering angle, you get that slip out. And uh, 
yeah, it's, it's, it's really nice. And at times, it does actually line up really well to my experience of being in a, in a, in a fast car when, when the backs come out. Um, so recently I was at Donington in a Radical SR3, for example, and uh, on, on the, one of the corners, uh, it's the right-hander just before you go. As you're going up the hill, there's a right-hander, then another right-hander. I don't know the corner names. Uh, the back of the car tended to pop out there, and there was a really distinct feel of just that traction loss of the rear. Bizarrely, this motion rig actually uh, captures that uh, pretty, pretty closely, really. Uh, much closer than any other rig I've used with traction loss. Um, a large part of that, I think, is uh, that the guys at IMSIM have done a really good job of uh, actually dialing things in as much as it is just the, uh, the, the, the technology that they are using. Being hypercritical, you do still have the thing with the traction loss that uh, if you're doing a quick left-right snap correction, you do have the thing where there's a little bit of a reset time to it and you can notice that. But in many ways, I actually think the compromise is worthwhile. Um, I think the vast majority of people using this simulator will really appreciate that traction loss system. Um, so it, ju it just really surprised me how well it works and how good it is on this, on this specific motion rig. Now, of course, with the IMSIM rigs, I think a big appeal of these rigs um, is the fact that it's, uh, it's in such a compact package. Um, and that's a nice, you know, that's, that's kind of what people are paying for these rigs is that these are used for commercial uh, enterprises or, you know, theme parks or people that just have a lot of money to want, you know, a fancy pants motion simulator in the house, but they want something that looks nice and tidy. So the quality of the motion, the traction loss and the package you get from this, uh, all neat and tidy is, is, is really, really nicely done. I'm going to keep going. We've got to do, we've got to do more than one lap here. I'm really getting, getting into this. We're getting to the flow of it here. We were, we were dilly-dallying through that first lap. Uh, unacceptable. We need to get a, bit more, let's get a bit more pace going here and try and balance the car a bit better. Now, you will notice a ooh, little bit of a slide there. On this rig, uh, we've, we've, we've got the uh, motion rig itself, but then we've also got the, uh, the triple screen uh, set up in front of us. They're just using uh, three Philips monitors, but they IMSIM have their own uh, monitor stand um, as well as this platform. The monitor stand also acts as a uh, PC holder, speaker holder, <laughs> and um, it's, it's designed nicely so that very quickly you can move the side monitors in or out, uh, depending on that type of view that you want. Um, contrary to what uh, as a lot of sim racers seem to think that you have to have the monitors surrounding you and you know some people actually don't want the monitors surrounding them because they get motion sick um, I'm one of those people I prefer having the monitors a bit wider um, also if you're doing filming which uh, unfortunately I have a habit of filming driving simulators and, and forcing you guys to watch all these videos but if you do filming being able to quickly move the screens and everything out the way um, is really really quite handy so uh, again that sort of quick adjustable uh, monitor stand really really quite nice obviously these are they're not building these for youtubers but these are again in, a, in that sort of uh, commercial environment having something that can be quickly adapted moved out of the way maybe so it's easier to get in and out of the rigs for, for different customers uh, those sort of subtle details can be can be really important now, uh, I have, well, we'll be showing this in other videos, but um, a big thing with, these, with this uh, IMSIM simulator as well is just the, the, the ability that you can just push buttons on the steering wheel to adjust the wheel height um, or adjust the pedals uh, in and out quickly. Um, obviously, the seat can be moved in and out. Um, again, that's kind of the, the thing with IMSIM is it's not necessarily stuff that matters so much if you're uh, using a simulator at home if you're a home user, but for events and venues, you can see that IMSIM have really thought about all those details and making it as seamless and as easy as possible for someone to, to get one of these simulators, set it up, and uh, people can jump in and out without problem. In terms of uh, features on the motion rig itself that I've not talked about yet, we also have uh, 
side, aside from the two rear actuators that uh, do uh, roll forwards and backwards and then the uh, traction loss, we also have a, a seatbelt tensioner, which is uh, it's a passive seatbelt system, but the, uh, the, the seatbelts will tension because they're mounted to the bottom of the rig, separate to the, uh, to the actuators. So when the rig moves forwards, that will automatically tension the seatbelts. Uh, which gives you a nice sensation, a little sensation of sort of that braking feel through your seat belts, but it's it's not particularly uh, strong. Um, it's not necessarily detailed enough to actually work your braking out from, but it's, it's certainly a really nice immersive feature. Um, and I, quite, I personally, I quite like the passive uh, seat belt systems. From a functional standpoint, though, in terms of actually helping you drive as well as immersion, this rig also has four. D box actuators um, positioned uh, two at the front, one, one on the left of the pedal tray, one on the right of the pedal tray, and then one to the right of my uh, bottom on the back of the seat and one to the left of my bottom of the seat. So it's kind of replicating the position of each wheel. Um, and uh, what those uh, butt kickers do, they're basically they are tactile transducers, what they do is they uh, take in game telemetry, like the motion system, like the motion. Uh, forces, they take the in-game telemetry and then they vibrate, for example, uh, however you want them to, but normally it'll be for like tyre slip, uh, so uh, if, if one wheel is uh, slipping on the road surface, the tactile transducer can vibrate in differing amounts uh, to convey uh, which tyre is slipping and to what extent it's slipping. Um, also, particularly good with tactile transducers, and this is something you can do with your home simulator really affordably. Uh, check out my 150 pound motion rig video if you, if, you, if you want this on your home rig for a budget. But uh, one thing they do really well is um, stuff like uh, when you change gear, you can have uh, the seat transducers do a really nice clunk for each gear shift, which is a, a really nice uh, immersive effect. And another effect that I really like from the tactile transducers, even though it's a little bit gimmicky, doesn't help you drive, is when you're parked in the pit lane, and uh, the engine's just sort of whirring over, um, not really doing anything except sort of low RPMs, uh, you can have the tactile transducers mirror that RPM feel and it, and it almost, or quite surprisingly similar to being sat in a real car, gives you that sort of, oh, there's an engine ticking over and that anticipation of then going out on the track and driving. Um, so, you know, with this, you've got the combination of the tactile transducers uh, with the motion rig, so, in many ways, I think the tactile transducers on this rig make up for the lack of having those uh, front actuators uh, that, that personally I really look forward to and uh, like in motion simulators. But uh, really, that, I think that's most of, uh, most of what's on this rig. I will say, the, the seat that we're driving on is surprisingly luxurious and comfortable. Um, normally, bucket seats are, are, are a bit harsh and uh, not very accommodating, but uh, Imsim have definitely gone for uh, fat people can drive the rig and still enjoy it with a bit of comfort. And uh, it's actually got quite good lumbar support on this, despite the chair being uh, quite upright. Uh, I have terrible back pains and back posture and just, yeah, I'm pathetic. But this uh, seat uh, actually feels really, really nice and plush. It's like a luxurious, luxurious throne to sit on. So here we have the IMSIM motion platform fully configured and set up, but as we're at the IMSIM factory, I thought you guys might like to see what this is like when disassembled and how IMSIM have quite cleverly managed to hide all the uh, ca cables and just make it as neat and tidy as possible, despite it having a wheel, pedals, shifter, handbrake, and then a motion solution. So we're gonna go over to the factory here where we have the simulator semi-assembled or half disassembled and positioned upside down. We also have Jose here um, with us who's uh, here to make sure that I don't give incorrect details and also let you know the inner workings. But if we just take a close look here, it's actually uh, pretty phenomenal how we've got in the middle the uh, power supply for the main power brick, which will be for uh, the, the motion actuators uh, on the back that actually lift it, but also for this traction control, traction loss motor. Then they've got the actual rail system here for the traction loss. Um, 
all this cabling goes in here from a front port here that's the, the power goes in there and you've also got the uh, PC connectors. That means that all the cabling can be routed through the rig and hidden out the way. Um, if you look at the, look at the cable tidying and the uh, tolerances there, absolutely fantastic. Way better than my cable tidying at home. I need to uh, steal someone from IMSIM to sort my rig out. Um, you also notice even just like little subtle things, which seem a bit silly, but the degree to how much flex they've got in the cable. So when there is any movement, the cables aren't rubbing or they're not going to wear out. So they can set this up. They've got it done at the factory. And basically, once they've sold one of these, they can uh, be pretty sure that the, uh, the person who's bought it is not going to have a problem with it in a few months time. It's going to just stay solid. And obviously for, and for, for centers and uh, theme parks or for clients that are just buying these high-end simulators, having it so once they bought it, they can sort of forget about it or they just leave it running is really important. What have I missed about this base here? What have I not included in that little? Okay, so the power supply is also actually responsible for the power for the butt kickers. And um, it's quite uh, important because the butt kickers actually consume more than 60% of the power of the power supply. So the electric actuators actually only consume uh, 200 watts, more or less. So, um, so e each, each uh, motion actuator is, uh, is how many watts each? It's between 40 and 70 watts. Okay, so that, that's quite surprising that the motion actuators are a lot less power than the, the, all, the uh, butt kickers are tactile transducers, are basically speakers almost. Mm -hmm. So that's quite a surprise, but yeah. So you can see all those cables going through there. And then um, that's most of the base here. Obviously this is upside down, so that's why it's a bit out of the way. And they, they all, when they actually ship this, this would have a, a plate on it. So it'd all be exactly. even more hidden and uh, obviously no dust and things could build up in it. So uh, here's the actual top part of the rig, the rig turned over. You can see the base plate here, which is what we were just looking at there, upside down, exposed, lift, lifting the skirt there of the base plate. Baby, it's you. component. Um, what's quite interesting with this, I thought, was uh, the, so the way it's got the, it uses the two uh, motion actuators on the back, which are the same as this this motion actuator here, but then they've actually packaged that into these here. So it's got a controller and an actuator in, in each of these rear bars, which is which is cool. And it's all, um, the way they finish this off, there's no like seams or joins. It's, it's absolutely seamless, which is quite nice, quite nice attention to detail. Um, but, so that, that motion, the way this works is that you've got a uh, pivot point here yeah. uh, underneath that then uh, those actuators move the rig on. So it uh, lets it uh, control all that movement from just, just the two actuators at the back. Um, on the rig here, obviously there's no seat here, or maybe it's just a really new special IMSIM transparent uh, Klingon seat possibly, but uh, there's no seat on here, but that's so you can see the uh, board down here, which has the, uh, that has a sound card on it for the for the butt kickers as exactly. well as what, what else? An amplifier. So this is the amplifier for the four channels of each butt kicker. And also you can see here the USB connections to each side. So you have four, four USB connections, two to the left and two to the right. Okay, that's cool. And then uh, then we have more ports here. What's, what's going on there? So this is a powered hub. So it supplies seven USB um, plugs so you can plug the pedals, the steering wheel and other accessories that you want. And then we have the actual uh, part that the uh, pedals uh, actually attach to and this is quite cool and again something I've not seen in other simulators is this this moves up and down controllable by the user but because it, uh, at first I actually saw this at Simulation Expo, I thought it used um, electronics to actuate it which obviously would be quite convoluted and overly complicated what they've actually done is they've got a, a hydraulic piston in here so once you've pushed the pedals up you can just push a button uh, near the uh, near the well it's just underneath where your wheel would be mounted to this is the wheel mount here and that means that you can very easily push that button you can just push the pedals away from you to get them away with using your leg power uh, i know so much effort or you can take your legs off it and push the button and it'll come back nice and smooth um, that's really nicely done, uh, really nice sort of attention to detail. And again, uh, you see this little, what looks like a chain is actually uh, what the cables are all rooted into that to make sure that they don't rub, wear and tear. Again, the whole thing, I mean, IMSIM sort of went over this with me. The whole thing is that they are producing this in, in a way where it doesn't break. They want to make it totally bomb proof. Uh, up top, you've also got the same situation with another piston. And uh, this is, 
uh, again, operates very similar to the, to the tray at the bottom. Um, you've got a button right where the uh, steering wheel is. Again, easily accessible by the, by the uh, person sat in the simulator. Um, to, to move that wheel up and down. Actually, has a really good range of motion. And then the whole design of this arm uh, means that it's, it's really rigid. So once you've got like a direct drive wheel on it, it's got quite a lot of torque coming through it, all the motions going on, you know, it all stays as a single solid unit. Uh, and uh, I don't know, in, uh, to me, I think what's nice with this as well is they've, they've done this whole solution in a very small package. And in terms of uh, actual foot space again these are kind of things maybe at home it's not the most important thing i don't know you know you might like how it looks or you want something that looks kind of car like at home but you know you might have more space you might not but in a venue situation where you might want to have a lot of simulators or you have people walking around simulators it's really important that you know kids aren't tripping over cables or there's no things to get caught when stuff's being cleaned all the stuff that happens in a in a theme park or a venue when there's no one looking after it and moderating it it's you know it's got to be a nice tidy unit and i think they've done a really good job of achieving that um, and you know it also looks a bit like a sort of formula cockpit motif style going on um, i think that's most of the points of the rig obviously we've distilled this into a into a very quick video i'm sure imsimmer T uh, pulling the hair out. You've missed this, you've missed that. What? <laughs> but uh, is there anything that you would say in particular that should stand out? Uh, regarding the footprint, it's actually interesting that we developed this to, to fit a normal door. So it, the, the length is two meters and uh, the width is uh, uh, 80 centimeters. So it's a very, very compact. And also regarding commercial usage, it's very easy to enter and exit uh, if you compare it to a rig that has like side profiles and stuff like that. Okay, so that's, yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. I think it's also a part of sim racing that obviously my, myself and my channel, we, we're obviously all home sim racing equipment, uh, but it's quite nice to see this kind of gap between you know, it's effectively an arcade machine or, a, 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 you know, a, a, a public venue machine for sim racing. Uh, absolutely awesome to see. But uh, big thanks there for that Thank little you. tour of the rig. Congratulations, you made it to the heat death of the universe and the end of this video. What did we learn from this? Well, the first lesson was that IMSIM are currently producing the most advanced USB hub disguised as a motion simulator platform. IMSIM's new Talento pedals are some of the easiest and quickest to adjust pedals on the market. The guys at IMSIM are completely mental when it comes to small details. Portuguese people don't sleep and dinner time begins at around 10pm and finishes sometime next week. And I didn't witness any intellectual property infringement whilst walking the streets in Portugal late at night. All said and done, what an amazing trip that you guys didn't get to go on because you're not filthy influencers. It was awesome spending time with the Sim Pit as well as Race Beyond Matter. Go and subscribe to their channels if you haven't yet. And I can't wait to see the guys from Imsim again in the future. In the coming future, I will be reviewing a set of the Talento pedals, so keep your eyes glued to your screen in the Gamer Muscle channel for that. But uh, until then, and until our next video, thank you very much for watching, happy tea drinking, and goodbye everybody.